scripture lesson this day comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 1 beginning with verse 18. Hear the word of God. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to quietly divorce her. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then Joseph woke up. He did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Always gets off congested up here. I'm always thinking I'm going to bite it on this thing too. We, All right. Let's see. Let's make sure. Okay. Will you pray with me? Our gracious God, your spirit is here this day as we come together, as we are nearing that day that we celebrate the birth of your son, and yet there is so much to do. Lord God, help us to hear your word for us clearly this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So yesterday was our family Christmas party. Over the years, we had learned that with four siblings, all married, all with kids, and then you try to overlay a firefighter schedule on top of a pastor's schedule, that all of us trying to get together on either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day was getting increasingly difficult because then you also had to factor in all the in-law schedules for all those siblings and so we finally decided several years ago it would be easier to just celebrate all together the weekend before Christmas and so yesterday was our family celebration this year of course was a particular blessing and celebration as my sister Kathy, who was just diagnosed with a really aggressive form of breast cancer, was able to attend, and also my mom with her health issues with COPD, we were all able to come together and celebrate. But as it is, because of relationships and distances and stuff, my house usually tends to be the place where we gather. And of course, this year was the same we were coming together to descend on my house, and so oh, Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, I'm trying to get all ready, and this year I really, really worked hard on trying to make it simple. We tried to pare down the decorations and a simple menu, and we weren't going to do gifts this year, and yet I still found myself in those last hours just harried. So... So much so that even Saturday morning, I didn't get a chance to even grab a shower. Of course, I was going to get to that later, right? So I threw on a pair of jeans and a long sleeve t-shirt, and I get down in the kitchen, and we're doing the food prep and getting the dining room table set up and everything, and oh my gosh, all of a sudden, it was time. The doorbell's ringing, family's coming in. When was the last time my family was on time, <laughs> right? <laughs> But they all show up, and they're at the door, and there I am, just bare face, no makeup, my hair all up in a hair tie. I got my T-shirt on with the, you know, the makings of the food splattered across, and that was it. They were there. No point now, right? 
So that is how we celebrated together. I was barely holding it together. And my personal presentation was belying what was really going on on the interior of my life. How many times do we show up someplace all put together on the outside, but struggling to hold it all together on the inside? Have you ever stopped to think about how much Mary and Joseph were struggling to hold it all together? When we pause to think about the nativity story of Jesus, we most often think of the soft and civilized version that we've created from our favorite carols like Away in the Manger. Little Lord Jesus lays down his sweet head. Oh, the cattle are lowing. What's lowing? <laughs> but, but they're doing it. They're quietly lowing, right? And, and Jesus wakes up, and he doesn't fuss, and he doesn't cry, and he lays down that sweet head. Yep, that's exactly how it is. <laughs> Why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we create this impossible scene? Because we somehow cannot attribute the messy details to the Holy Family. Even though time and time again, Bible story after Bible story, God keeps using flawed real, ordinary people just like us, just like you and me, to share his message of love and forgiveness and redemption. Almost every Bible character you can find is flawed and real and ordinary. And yet God uses them for the good news. Now it's true that neither Mark, neither Matthew or Luke give us a lot of detail about the circumstances of Jesus' birth, but hey, Mark and John, they don't give us any details at all, so we're a little better off with Matthew and Luke. But we tend to gloss over the scandalous parts and skip right on over to the quiet, serene nativity that we've conjured up over the centuries. So let's take a moment to recast our images. <coughs> Mary was a single, unwed teenage mother. She was not the celebrated Madonna that we now picture. She spent nine months, or at least four or five months, hiding in shame, trying to do all she could to hide the baby bump. She wasn't proudly posting on Facebook her swelling belly and the glorious nature of pregnancy. She wasn't enhancing the joy and the beauty of pregnancy. She was trying to explain away three months of the flu. And she was binding her belly in an effort to hide the obvious. And her shame was not only hers. Her shame was her family's and her fiancé's. No one was throwing her a baby shower. There was no registry for camel seats and swaddling clothes and yak milk rash ointment. <laughs> but you know, it wasn't that long ago in our own society, when it was a breach of etiquette to throw a shower for an unwed mother? How ironic is that? Culture dictated that we don't give gifts and support to the one person 
who probably needed it the most. An unwed teenage mother. Mary didn't get to chat it up with the other women at the well in the early mornings about her pregnancy. She didn't get to ask for the wisdom of the generations of the other women that gathered at the well. She had no one easing her anxiety about her changing body and her hormones and her sudden craving for gefilte fish. This is the Mary, this is the Mary that we have in our mind's eye. Serene and, and rosy, that's the Mary that we have. Really? You just gave birth in a barn. <laughs> No sweat, no exhaustion, are you kidding me? No anxiety or fear, and there was like no asking, hey, where's the user manual guide for this? Really? That's not probably what it was like in those first hours. And then there's Joseph. And then there's Joseph, the character that's most overlooked in the nativity. A man who was engaged, betrothed, pledged, whatever word you want to use to translate this legal contract. He was legally, by Gap, he was legally bound to marry. And this wasn't a romantic declaration, oh, marry me, Mary. Okay? This was a ling legally binding contract that had been arranged. And it was binding to proclaim that Mary and Joseph were actually married without the consummation of the relationship or even living together. So basically, it's all the rights and the responsibilities and the toils of marriage without the fun. That's actually kind of completely backwards from our culture today. How many couples now get married without living together first? Everybody loves a test drive. But Mary and Joseph have not consummated their relationship. She is still living with her family. So Joseph can only conclude the one thing when he learns of Mary's pregnancy, that she has been unfaithful to him. He has been betrayed. He's heartsick, and he's angry, and he's frustrated. And yet Matthew describes Joseph as righteous. And we've been conditioned a bit to wonder how it is that Joseph can be called righteous when he first planned to abandon Mary. But look at his state of mind. Look at his state of mind. His soon-to-be wife is carrying another man's child. And he would have been well within his rights to have publicly exposed her which would have likely led to her being stoned to death. He was also within his rights to divorce her, and that is what would have been culturally accepted, and that's what he proposed to do, because that would have at least spared Mary's life. Given the laws and the conditions and the cultures of the day, yes, Joseph was righteous, and he was well within his rights. It takes the intervention of an angel to persuade Joseph to act contrary to what is culturally right and acceptable, and to keep 
Mary as his own. And doing that, he takes on and shares Mary's shame and exhaustion from the community. Joseph and Mary had to endure a secret birth in an unwelcoming town. There was no birthing tent, no experienced midwives. There was no partner Lamaze class. It was just pull the donkey over, the baby's coming. <laughs> and this is the very, very best news for us. That God works through real people with real challenges. He didn't choose a fairy tale princess to bear the Savior, but rather an unwed peasant girl. He didn't choose a political or business success story to name and raise and care for Jesus, but rather a man with his own doubts and questions who wanted to do the right thing but needed an angelic intervention to be able to accomplish it. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. God coming to us as we are. Not as who we think we should be, or not who we're trying to be, or not who we may become someday, but God with us, who we are now, today, in this moment, in this moment, in jeans, and a t-shirt with the day splattered all over it. <laughs> this is God with us. We all have moments where we struggle to hold it all together. To look like we have it all together on the outside, but we know the inside is a train wreck. But God wants our real selves. That's who he calls to give birth to the Savior People who were being their real selves. He wants us to come to this place and be ourselves. To share the real stories of our lives, our uncertainties and our failures, our worries and our strains, our searches and our losses, so that we can authentically know the love and the hope and the encouragement and the excitement and, yes, the joy and the peace of real Christmas. Christmas, the intersection of our need and God's redemption. The place where God comes to us through Christ the Lord, way back then with Mary and Joseph and even now with us. Yes, God with us. Accepting us as we are and will use us for good. May this place be a place where we don't have to hide the real us. 
a place where we don't have to hide our struggles, but a place where we can be known and a place where we will know Emmanuel, God with us. Merry Christmas.